Welcome to the Sacramento Clean Tech Showcase, panel discussion on innovations in supply, featuring renewables, storage, microgrids, and demand response solutions. The showcase is brought to you by Startup Sac and Clean Start, with support from SMUD. Now on to the panel, moderated by Gary Simon, founder of Clean Start. So now we're going to move to the second panel, uh, which really talks about um, adding to the supply base, the storage. Um, and in particular, we're going to be talking about, in a couple of ways, the vehicle to grid uh, opportunity uh, that we have in the mobility sector. Um, so we've got uh, five more panelists coming up here in terms of, of talking about what the opportunities are uh, in this other area. So let's first introduce Kevin Wolf, who's the president and CEO of Wind Harvest International. Um, Kevin, you've got a very unique wind technology, not one that, that uh, in the broadest sense hasn't been seen before, but you seem to be getting it to work a lot better than anybody has in the past. Can uh, you open our discussion here as to the opportunity for adding renewable power from wind through the technology that you're developing? Sure. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, these uh, the traditional turbines, horizontal axis turbines, they have a single blade and it has a single point here and that blade will shake if it's in turbulence. So they have to be spread far apart in wind farms and they have to be raised up out of the turbulent zone of wind near the ground. So that leaves this resource, this kind of what we call the mid-level resource of somewhere between 15 and 100 feet above the ground with no technology to harvest it. Now, this is not in every place in the country, but in SMUD's wind farms and the wind farms in California, there is an excellent mid-level resource that's underneath the, the blades of their turbines. The, uh, the problem is solved with a vertical axis wind turbine, and we have our turbine here. If, can, I share, should I, can I share my screen here with you? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Let me do that and um, share the screen and, oh shoot. Okay, dang it. I thought I had this set up for sharing. Uh-oh. I'm oh, sorry, hang on. Um, share a screen and um, dang it. Um, hang on, uh, okay, I'm a, <laughs> just one second. Um, you can't see it. So anyways, I'm just gonna go through it and tell you. Um, as I can't get the screen to share. Um, so the tall turbines um, shake as they move in through the, the near ground wind resource. And our turbines have two points connected at two points to each blade to a center shaft and they are doing a vertical action. And they have a natural stall and they are able to handle the uh, complexities of, of chaotic near ground wind much more naturally than a horizontal axis turbine. The difficulty in these turbines a development is there's been no aeroelastic model. Well, we finally have the first aeroelastic model that allows us to, to properly predict frequency response and power performance and loads. And without that, all the past vertical axis turbines have failed. So now we have our turbine in Texas at the uh, near ground, uh, at the UL's advanced wind turbine testing facility. It is going through technology readiness level seven, the pilot project phase of, of testing and it is um, scheduled through coming through commercialization in 2023. Um, we'll be installing or ordering them now for the next version of the turbine. And we will be showing, um, uh, we expect to be doing projects in 2023. The key in this, uh, this market, our key market is the, the largest market is the understory of wind farms. And every wind farm in California has an excellent near ground wind resource or a good to excellent. In the Solana resource area, there's probably almost 5,000 megawatts that can be installed. On the Montezuma Hills and the SMUDS project, because of the erosion issues, probably only 50 megawatts can be installed in the understory of the horizontals. So what we have is this enormous opportunity to add a lot of electricity that is generated all, you know, all day long in the summer and at night all summer long as the winds, the delta breezes come through that area. So it's a natural uh, asset for all of Northern California, especially in the summer. The 
process of getting that is to develop pilot projects. Because if you're going to go into the salon and wind farms, you better prove that you're not going to hurt the horizontal axis turbines. So we're bringing in a Doppler LIDAR to measure downwind wakes. The resource says that these shed vortices downwind dissipate after about 70 meters, and they bring the faster moving wind from up above down to the ground. That means that you can, according to the studies out of Caltech and Stanford, existing horizontal axis turbines should receive about a 10% increase in energy output with rows of vertical axis turbines in front of them. So it's an enormous opportunity to not only make use of excellent wind resource land that cannot presently be used, but to increase the output of the existing stock of, of turbines. To get into that resource, you got to do, besides the LIDAR studies, you also got to prove you're not killing birds. So north of Highway 12, um, about a mile or so uh, away from the, the wind resource area, we have a, a project on a ranch there that we are pursuing a permit for a Five one to seven, left. for one minute. Yep. Mm -hmm. A five to seven megawatt um, solar wind hybrid project, and that will do bird studies on. What we'd like to have from SMUD is one: evaluate your mid-level wind resource. Your 2005 study shows it as a negative wind shear in these areas in the afternoons. It shows an, just an excellent mid-level resource, and SMUD should evaluate that fully. Evaluate their resource. We'd also like to have some uh, a person on our, our bird study uh, team advisory board to help us think through all the bird study issues that would allow us to enter the SMUD resource area. And ideally eventually have a pilot project that feeds into the Rio Vista grid. So not into the main grid, but feeds right into the Rio Vista grid and provides us an opportunity to prove how well our turbines operate uh, with, the, with the horizontal axis turbines. Lastly, we are raising, we got out of the Valley of Death through using a crowdfunding campaign. We raised $1.5 million roughly last year from it. And we we're about to launch another two and a half million dollar raise. And this raise is the capital that we need to get out of technology readiness level nine, which says you gotta have uh, turbines operating for a couple years before banks will finance large projects. Fine. I'll stop there. Great, well, that, that you know, it's very interesting. And this technology has developed a lot over the last 30 years. Uh, we do have a question. Uh, what's the maximum power output of your uh, horizontal axis turbine? I know they come in different sizes, but just yeah, so they come in pairs, always in pairs, a meter apart, because when they're a meter apart, Bernoulli's continuity principle sends that, it speeds up that wind through the gap and increases the energy output of the pair. So pairs come in 140 kilowatts in a resource area like Solano, down in Barbados, where it's trade winds, there'll be 100 kilowatt units. And in terms of, you know, roughly looking at the Smud Solano wind farm, I mean, Paul this morning said that they're looking for 3,000 megawatts in the plan uh, from renewables and, and storage. Uh, what do you think you might be able to do just in the Solano wind farm itself going with the mid-level resource? Well, in the, in, the, in the Smuds wind resources, we calculated about 50 megawatts. But in the whole region, and that's about a 6.7 meter per second site at our hub height, which is about right. 15 to 20 meters above the ground. But in that whole region, including north of Highway 12, where traffic Air Force Base does not allow tall turbines, but they will allow our turbines, you can put in about 5,000 megawatts. So it's an enormous resource, but there are no, you can't add any more tall turbines to the resource. Right, right. So something that's much more compatible with the resources left. Well, um, that really that's test turbines down in in, uh, in uh, Palm Springs, an earlier version. Right. So the ones that I, I remember you're working on now, they're actually lighter weight than what's shown in the, the, the picture. Oh, there. yeah, and they're much larger and they have only three blades and they have only six arms and they're much more efficient. And they are, um, you know, they're just uh, amazingly tough machines. They'll last for 40 plus years. They use ferrite uh, permanent magnet generators, not rare earth magnet generators. They use inversion power converters that connect into 1741 grid connection standards. They're made at the, so most of the product is made in the United States. There's a place in West Sacramento, American Metals that can make most of our turbines. So we're looking at making them locally, ship, uh, uh, in, um, assembling them in Dixon and shipping them down to Solano and a short distance away. Oh, that's fantastic. So what happens in high winds? Is there, I mean, you often have to feather the props on the big horizontal axis. Yeah, so the benefit in a, a combined cycle is the tall turbines need to feather their 
blades as winds get to rated power or they start to have problems because gusts come through. So what you do is you set those turbines to start reducing their um, uh, efficiency before rated power and keep our turbines running. And therefore you keep the lower the wear and tear on the tall turbines and you have our turbines pick up the slack because we don't have a problem with turbulence, gusts and high wind uh, problems. Well, oh, very interesting. Well, quite an innovation. Oh, there's another picture that's, that's come up of, of what a system could look like. Yeah, that's a wind farm up in Simpson Ridge. That ridge line up there has an 8.4 meters per second wind resource at 15 meters above the ground. So these wind places like in Wyoming, where they, they don't want more damage to their view, view sheds. Well, they've got the tall turbines in the view shed. Add another layer, you can hardly see them. Right, right. Well, that's fantastic. Well, let's let's move on to the other side of the equation for those 3,000 megawatts storage. And uh, call on Ezra Beeman, who's the founder and managing director of, uh, let's see now, Energia, Ener, I never know how to pronounce that, Ezra. Um, but at any rate, you've made quite a bit of uh, progress in your home energy system. And really one that, that you've designed from the beginning is being grid interactive and providing a lot of other benefits uh, than just kilowatt hours of storage for the homeowner. And you're about to do a, a big deployment. So tell us uh, what problem you're trying to solve and, and uh, how you're going about it. Great. Uh, so first of all, thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here today. Um, I think we are maybe not the longest suffering, but we've been here a while. Um, so uh, the problem we're trying to solve is uh, focused on decentralized energy. Right now, the cheapest kilowatt hour, probably maybe even cheaper than energy efficiency at this stage, uh, is the kilowatt hour you produce on your roof and you use that doesn't go outside of your house. Uh, and that's one of the, the key powers of decentralized energy. Uh, you don't need all the rest of the infrastructure. Um, although uh, the uh, industry insiders would say, well, but what about the time the sun's not sh uh, shining? And that's fair enough. What we are seeing in advanced um, economies like Germany, like Australia, and soon to be California, is you can get too much of a good thing. Um, here we have some of the key challenges of as you have higher levels of decentralization, you can see Australia there is forecast to be up to 50% by 2040. The United States is much lower than that, but California is on a trajectory that's, that's going to be closer to Australia uh, just because of the, the, the quality of the solar resource. Uh, the grid reaches its limits, and I'm not talking, it's reaching its limits in a couple of ways. One, you get to zero times of zero load on the system. Uh, which has got all kinds of issues for uh, stability, uh, frequency control, voltage, um, and you also experience it in the uh, distribution networks uh, as well. Uh, and in, in certain markets, Germany and Australia are leading in that area, you actually cannot install rooftop in some states without the, the ability to curtail it. They're also radically overhauling the feed-in tariffs. I mean, in California, we already have radical overhaul of the feed-in tariffs under the latest proposals. Uh, and so there's a whole bunch of uh, forces that are pushing back on solar on its own. Now, battery is a natural solution, but battery storage is complex uh, and it's costly. And here we have, I think, what would be considered a not uncommon uh, installation here where you've got one particular battery installed. You've got uh, additional equipment for the interconnection, for the, the whole of house um, backup. Uh, you've got the uh, inverter for the solar array. You've got some various other boxes. I'm not sure what they do, but this is not uncommon. So. Um, what we have done is develop a solar uh, storage solution um, that addresses some of the key challenges that we're facing. One is it removes the complexity through an all-in-one hybrid, um, uh, hybrid inverter, which has the, the um, solar inverter and the battery inverter and the batteries all in the one box. It reduces uh, costs associated with installation. It looks better uh, and it operates better because it's integrated. Um, the other thing that we're doing is addressing some of the, the shortfalls of the current approach, uh, which are things like um, derating. A lot of these batteries, it uh, doesn't take much before they have to derate uh, because of heat. Um, and also the availability. A lot of them rely on internet connections and those aren't always available. So if you want to use these batteries uh, for the good of the grid, whether it's uh, by providing uh, services to the, the distribution networks or providing services to the market, it's really important that these resources are available, um, that they're high quality. 
Uh, and so that's really what uh, led us to um, developing a, a, a platform. And that platform is comprised of the box. The box has got our own battery management system, our own inverter, hybrid inverter. It doesn't have our own cells. We use cattle, the number one manufacturer of lithium iron phosphate cells in the world. Um, they sell to BMW, they sell to uh, Tesla. Uh, we also have developed our own patented artificial intelligence driven optimization software. So this anticipates what load at the customer premise is going to be. And we're building the capability. Anyway, he gave a good presentation still. I think he still did a good job explaining. And then at Whoops. Thanks. Somebody. That was a glitch. Sorry, keep going. Um, and the third thing is the fleet management. So together, this provides a platform that we see uh, one that can be built on for providing all the value uh, stacks that are that are uh, addressable by storage. Um, in terms of the actual business itself, uh, we think our key advantages are threefold. One, simplicity, as I said, streamlined installation, certainty of compatibility of the integration of components, single point of hardware and maintenance. And for those uh, aggregators that are emerging, this is all really important. It's also really important for the homeowner when it comes to um, the installation and the, and the user experience. One Flexibility, we have the whole, um, the whole IP stack. Uh, and that sets us apart. Most folks have either built some software or they've built some hardware. They don't have the full stack. Um, that means we can upgrade the whole thing remotely. Um, and in future, we intend to integrate it with other people's technology at each one of the stack components. And then finally, speed of, of, of response. So because we have our own engineering core, which is currently in Australia, but we're uh, in the process of our market entry, we're targeting Hawaii, California, and New York um, for, uh, for our solution. Uh, that it's really important as things are changing all the time. We've got changes to interconnection standards. We've got changes to um, uh, market arrangements. And this is because of things like managing frequency and control. So being able to respond uh, quickly, we're on our third generation. Um, it's going to be really important. Uh, just in terms of the AI, um, this is non, I guess this is uh, maybe not surprising. We're using weather, we're using historic usage patterns, we're using whether or not people are in their homes, what their the state of the battery is uh, to drive that optimization. And that's how you unlock significantly more benefits from these batteries. In terms of what it looks like and, and when it's installed, uh, I'll go back to here to remind you what a typical install time. currently looks like. I wait at time. Um, one, one this minute. Is what, this is what we actually achieve. I mean, this is on a real wall in a real garage. Um, this one, they actually have the lines going up. This one is actually an invisible installation. Uh, so we think it looks good too. Thank you. Any Very questions? good, Andrew. So what's your typical system cost? Uh, we are aiming for a... Uh, about a 7,500 um dollar in us dollar installation sorry the, the cost uh for the unit um and that includes all the hardware um uh, and this has got a almost a 14 kilowatt hour five kilowatt configuration so it's very comparable to the to the powerwall except we have our own solar inverter so you're saving money there uh, off the bat all right very good well that's a you know a, a different approach uh you're based in davis right now so definitely a local company. You're looking for demos of, in California more worldwide. What, what could SMUD do for you in terms of, of setting up a, a, a demo? In terms of what they could do for us, so we've built this from the ground up to be grid uh, integrated. So, I, you know, I'm sure they, I know they've got virtual power plant um, uh, demonstrations already up. Um, just being able to demonstrate that that we're in that space uh, and that we've got a, a lower price point, higher performance level, um, which we think are going to radically uh, improve on the cost effectiveness of using this across the distribution network. All right, very good, thank you. Well, talking about virtual power plants, let's turn to Drew Smith. He's with Smarter Grid Solutions, and uh, Smarter Grid Solutions has been very active in developing microgrids, virtual power plants uh, across the country, uh, active in, in California. Drew's the sales leader for North American utility uh, distributed energy resource management systems. So you've had experience with installing these systems. Um, so tell us about what they're like, what gains they provide and, and what opportunities there might be here for SMUD, Drew? Yeah, uh, thanks so much, Gary, for having me. Uh, I wish we could all be together in person, uh, particularly since it was 
39 degrees and raining uh, here in Seattle this morning. Um, oh, but, uh, yeah, I was walking my daughter to, to school and that was unpleasant. But uh, just to dive in here, so as we add more renewables to the grid, we need to continue to ask ourselves, how can we optimize these assets? And one way to optimize renewables and storage is through the use of microgrids. In California, Sacramento, and really many places across the country, resiliency issues are becoming more and more common. These are having extreme major impacts on communities and businesses. Uh, I am a native New Orleanian, so I know uh, last summer with the hurricanes, as all six transmission lines in the city were wiped out and people were without power for, for multiple weeks, you know, it doesn't just harm the, uh, the businesses or the communities, but also really impacts the individu individuals. And so having solutions out there that can really deliver resiliency in these times of need are extremely important. But in a lot of places right now, uh, utilities, uh, businesses will throw in a diesel generator as a backup for a microgrid, uh, flip that area into an island and call it a day. But in my opinion, I don't really think that's solving the, the grander issue of what is driving the need for these microgrids. Energy storage and SGS's strata resilient software allows utilities, communities, and businesses to take their microgrids to the next level. Uh, Strata Resilience is a microgrid manager that doesn't just send the battery into islanding mode. It optimizes the DER assets for supply and manages flexible load. Looking at this from the angle of how can we reduce greenhouse gas emissions, the microgrid's objective function can be to prioritize renewable energy and use a, uh, as a, use a backup generator as little as possible. Uh, and even if the microgrid is designed uh, it well to really take advantage of renewable energy, then there are a lot of cases where a backup generator won't even be necessary. Uh, and SGS has been working with a utility in North America uh, that had had a devastating accident and wanted to rebuild a smart city. And so we're acting as the microgrid coordinator across that entire town, uh, working with uh, building management systems, uh, rooftop solar, energy storage. Uh, and the, the main goal of this entire uh, microgrid project is to maximize the use of greenhouse gases and not rely on this backup generator. So new energy storage assets, especially when paired with renewables, allow for a crucial balance to be struck between grid services and renewable energy targets aimed at reducing carbon emissions. Our software allows for a balancing act to occur and can be monitored 24 seven by the host utility using any existing SCADA or ADMS system portal. We work closely with our customers to understand their unique and needs and provide an operating scheme that fits. This is typically a dynamic process that is revisited on an annual or semi-annual basis to fine tune the scheme so that it continues to serve the needs in years to come. New energy programs, new resiliency needs, new grid service requirements, new carbon goals. We understand that these are ever evolving priorities and as the strata name would imply, we layer these priorities in a way that benefits our customers and their communities at large. As our customer needs change, Strata Resilience is the tool that allows them to adapt and maintain safety and reliability in an increasingly decentralized grid. But now there's this question of, we have all these DER assets on our grid, we don't really need to be in a microgrid mode, so what are they doing right now? Well, recently our parent company, Mitsubishi Electric Power Products Inc., or MEPI, commissioned a four megawatt battery for SMUD. There's so much potential for these assets to help with renewable growth. For example, in New York, SGS's other software, Sears Flex, was managing a fleet of batteries for Endurant Energy and uh, Consolidated Edison. The battery minute. provides load relief during peak summer months, but for the rest of the year, Endurant can use the batteries to participate in the New York ISO market. This opens up a lot of opportunity to expand renewables by allowing Endurant to take advantage of multiple revenue streams. Developers are gonna to wanna to partner with utilities to add batteries to the grid because there is a lot of profitability out there. And a utility like SMUD can benefit from an arrangement like this because they're able to utilize the batteries to provide load relief without having to pay for the batteries themselves. And on top of that, they can continue to add renewable energy to the grid knowing that bat the battery is managing these constraints and they won't have to upgrade uh, the, grid, the current grid infrastructure. So Smarter Grid Solutions got its start helping managing, helping utilities manage growing renewable penetration. So whether this is through optimizing renewable energy assets to provide resiliency in the form of a microgrid, or controlling storage and other DERs to provide reliability, we wanna help utilities smooth out their renewable transition. And we're willing, when we're happy to do that with 
not just utilities, but developers and other partners, businesses who want microgrids, et cetera. So we're there to help really push forward the, the, the DER transition. That's time. All right. Thank you very much, Drew. Now, you mentioned that you were involved with a city that had a disaster and, and you're rebuilding the system there. Can you tell us what city you're dealing with? Uh, yes, yeah, so it's um, it's Lac Megantic up in Quebec in uh, Canada. So uh, there's a, a major train disaster there back in 2013, and now we are, are working with them uh, on that microgrid up there. Uh, and for those of you who will be at Distribute Tech later in May, our director of products will be doing a, a case study uh, on that uh, at Distribute Tech. So please uh, come and stop by if you're there. Yeah, potentially good example of, of what can be done. Now, I'm also fascinated by your thoughts on, on building, uh, you know, DERMS, VPP, microgrid, whatever, around the, the Mesa, the Mitsubishi Energy Storage Project that you have here in, in Sacramento. So um, have you been exploring these ideas with SMUD in terms of what more could be done using that? I do it for level. I knew this was going to go to, oh, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, that's certainly something we want to explore with SMUD is you know, now that that battery's in there and our partnership with Mitsubishi uh, as our parent organization is that battery can, can become the, you know, the grid forming battery necessary to take that area to a microgrid and continue to expand. And one area we like to look at, especially when putting our technology out there is to take this path of least resistance. So you know, you'll be in safe hands with uh, Mitsubishi Electric uh, as our parent company. Uh, we can take it from a small step to, to see that it works for SMUD and then continue to expand on that microgrid from there. So, I mean, when you put the control and communication systems in, it's, it's not inexpensive. In terms of number of customers um, or any other metric, you know, megawatts control, what, what kind of size is sort of the sweet spot or doing something with a with a microgrid and the management systems that you're involved with? You know, it, it varies. It, it just all depends on really what, uh, what you want to get out of it. Is this a, a small community microgrid, which we can, you know, be on the smaller side, you know, with, you know, a 500 kilowatt battery as the basis for it with some rooftop solar. But uh, then if you're looking, you know, somewhere where, you know, on the outskirts of the grid where you're trying to do, you know, a fully off-grid, uh, microgrid, then, you know, it, it just depends on what the load is. Uh, and so it, it, it's so dependent on various factors. Okay, but I mean, something even as small as, as a 500 kW battery installation could be done. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And it, it could be done just for a manufacturing park or, or, or anything. It just, uh, yeah, depends on, uh, on how to do it. It can be very small to, to extremely large. So what kind of payback do people typically have when they install one of these systems? Yeah, it, it's, you know, a less than 10 year payback. It, okay. And then at the same time is, uh, I, I like to say that's challenging to put a, a price on resiliency, uh, particularly after talking to my brother, he didn't have power for three weeks. Uh, when I asked him at the time how much he would be willing to pay for energy then, uh, he, he threw out an enormous number. So uh, we like to view <laughs> just the payback, but the, the service that it provides. Interesting. Well, that, that's really um, matured quite a bit. Uh, obviously, microgrids are a huge topic, VPPs. And Paul Lau is, has talked about now specifically building out more of them in Sacramento. So good opportunity. And we want to make sure that you stay connected with what's going on here. But let's move to the topic now of, of tying in the vehicles uh, in the area to be a grid support resource. Uh, the EVs. And I hadn't heard the number before, but Paul this morning said that their goal is to get uh, 300,000, uh, serve 300,000 EVs in Sacramento region. That would mean that we would have a higher density per person of EVs than any other place in the country that we've been talking to. Um, huge opportunity then for having the bi-directional charging systems and how they can be used. So let's call on first Doug Alfaro, who's general manager of North America for Wallbox Chargers. Wallbox is, well, has made um, a good uh, market entry, um, very advanced product, 
um, originated in one of my favorite cities in the world, Barcelona. Um, and we'd like to hear more about what you can do, Doug, with um, controlling the, the vehicles, uh, charging in the system to support SMUD, both vehicle to home and vehicle to grid. So please uh, tell us about what you have. Fantastic. All right. Thanks so much, Gary. I'm going to pull up a presentation here. Uh, just a couple of slides. Let's get into presentation mode. Hope you can see that. Uh, so uh, again, my name is Douglas Alfaro. I'm the general manager for Wallbox uh, here in North America. So Wallbox is a manufacturer of intelligent charging and energy management systems. Uh, here in the U.S., we're actually based in the Bay Area, so we're just a little ways away. Uh, but as a global company, we're based in Barcelona, Spain. Um, you know, today we're here to focus on the bidirectional charging aspect and the different use cases and also value propositions that you might find with the technology. Uh, what's key to make the technology work is really the charging hardware. Uh, so that's what enables a vehicle to safely and intelligently extract the energy from the car and use it in a home, the building, or even send it back onto the grid. And for this functionality, we've introduced a product called Quasar Tube. That's what you see here in this photo. Um, and that's planned to be released in the US later this year. Um, that's actually been deployed already for the last two years throughout Europe uh, in different pilot programs with both automakers and utilities um, in scaled projects, numbering, um, you know, hundred uh, in the hundreds of chargers deployed in people's residence. So we're looking forward to being able to do that here locally uh, when we launch this product. Um, and uh, at the end of this presentation, I'll show you kind of a real world use of this that we actually use at our own headquarters in, in Barcelona, Spain. And so... When we talk about the different value propositions, I wanna kind of talk about the use cases. Um, one of them that's most prevalent is known as vehicle to home. This means using or leveraging the vehicle's battery for use within the home, not necessarily sending it back onto the grid. And even with that, you already have some key benefits like reducing power from the grid. For example, in a surge scenario where there might be a heat wave, you can run your, uh, your uh, air conditioning system from the power of your car. And by doing that, you're actually saving money, optimizing energy consumption, charging uh, when there's low prices at night and discharging when there might be high pricing, like during uh, time of use peak pricing uh, windows of hours. Uh, and then the kind of uh, other benefit that you have, as was mentioned before, is the resiliency aspect. So you have a giant battery sitting in your garage or in your driveway that can help power your home in the case of a great failure. Um, Kind of all this together also has some return on investment. So a few studies show that you can have anywhere between three hundred to thousand dollars per year in savings just by using these kinds of these kinds of strategies. Second kind of use case is vehicle to building. So same way as with home, you're optimizing energy use and generating savings. But actually, the highest benefit in this scenario is uh, avoiding what are called peak demand charges. So being able to leverage uh, by, by the building communicating to the different chargers and vehicles that energy to offset peaks during the most expensive time of power consumption, not just use, you're able to offset either penalties or high charges reduced uh, used in those uh, scenarios and also leverage renewable energy most efficiently. Let's say you have solar panels that are generating in excess, you can actually store that in the fleet of vehicles uh, when uh, instead of sending it back onto the grid and actually self-consume that when it's most beneficial to the building. So a couple other use cases there. Uh, what gets really interesting is both for vehicle to building and vehicle to home to add vehicle to grid uh, to that use case. So this requires, this is a little bit more complex, requires a bit more like an interconnection agreement and also grid disconnect devices uh, to be paired with, with your charger, um, but opens fundamentally new um, kind of uh, use cases where you can send energy back on the grid and support flexibility services for grid stabilization. Um, you can do this very quickly and support frequency response. Um, or just you know, shave your peaks and, and also integrate renewable energy uh, within uh, kind of building or home use by having an aggregator or a utility send commands to that charger to optimize what's good for the distribution grid. Um, so in closing, I just wanna show kind of what that looks like in, in real life. Uh, so this is our building in Barcelona, Spain. It's a snapshot of uh, common day. Uh, mm -hmm. What you have from, from top to bottom is a uh, grid power limit. If you exceed that limit in Barcelona, they cut your power. So you definitely don't wanna do that. Um, the green line is the theoretical usage of the building or the demand. So you see it would have exceeded the limit. 
Uh, the blue is what the building actually consumed when it's utilizing quasars to offset the energy. Uh, yellow is actually solar capacity that you can see later in the day helps reduce the building's load. Uh, but a real focus is really on the purple line. So you can see between 7 and 10 a.m., the quasars discharged heavily to offset that giant peak that would have sent the energy over the power limit. Um, and then late at night, around midnight to 3, actually started to charge um, because that's when energy is cheapest and when the building is consuming the least amount. So this kind of shows this uh, in action. You can imagine this on a smaller scale within a home or a larger scale within buildings or even at grid level. Um, and that's the kind of um, you know, use cases that, that bidirectional charging can, um, can uncover. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Gary, you're muted. Um, on bidirectional charging, um, and in some of the bigger use cases like vehicle to grid, you were saying that that you, there's some technology improvement that that needs to be done. Where are you on that, and when do you expect to be able to roll out technology that's that's fully functional for vehicle to grid? Yeah, so the vehicle to grid technology is here already. Um, so what what I was referring to was the additional need of uh, kind of interconnection uh, hardware, as you might see in a solar installation or a storage installation to be added to kind of the dynamics of the charger. So um, this is this is here today. Um, what's kind of being uh, still uh, developed is the communication between the vehicles, the charger and the grid. Uh, so these standards are still in, let's call them draft form. Um, they were available for many years with the, the Chatamo standard. So the Nissan Leaf is a vehicle that's capable of doing this. Uh, but only most recently is this being defined now for the new generation of EVs that are that are coming down to uh, to consumers like the Ford F-150 Lightning, the, the Chevy Silverado, and, and, and these others that have communicated that they will be uh, bidirectional capable. So it just requires a bit more integration with the grid. Uh, so as a solar and storage system would have um, interconnection devices and also interconnection agreement. Um, so it's a bit more cost um, uh, in there for, for the end user if they actually want to put energy onto the grid as opposed to you know, using it for self-consumption. So that leads me to think that the opportunity with, with SMUD, given that they're trying to be uh, very forward looking, uh, might be to work out some of those uh, grid to vehicle agreements that you need and, and show that. So we'll have more discussion on that, I'm sure. And uh, do you have many big deployments of wall box chargers in California yet? Not in California yet. So this has largely been uh, prevalent throughout Europe, uh, mostly in the UK, um, because there's very easy access to what are called wholesale markets or open markets for energy. Um, and the utility suppliers there um, are, let's say, designed program to be able to incentivize or provide incentives to users, uh, so at the home level or at the building level, uh, to reap some benefits for some of that energy being put back onto the grid. And so uh, as important as you know, clarification around interconnection and uh, facilitating that or supporting uh, you know, those technologies uh, to facilitate putting energy on the grid, the design for programs that can provide benefits to users for putting energy onto the grid are equally important. And that varies a lot by region, by utility, by priorities. And so that's another area I think of, of great support to, to really see this uh, proliferate. All right, very good. Appreciate that. Let's move on to uh, John Fortune. Uh, John is uh, with Swell. Uh, he's the vice president of the grid services market development. Um, and Swell's taken a somewhat different approach uh, to the question of integrating all these electric vehicles and charging so that they have maximum benefits into the system. So um, John, tell us what uh, uh, developments you have in, in your company and, and where you're heading. Sure. Thank you uh, for inviting us to, to speak today. I think, you know, a lot of folks have already talked about some of the elements that, that Swell's very involved in. So I'll, I'll kind of preface that um, Swell Energy uh, is a, a company whose mission is to remove barriers to the mass adoption of clean energy technology, both with homeowners uh, businesses, uh, in the future, uh, renter markets, multifamily properties. And we do this 
um, by bringing, uh, you know, different distributed energy resource technologies uh, together uh, with uh, property owners, um, industry partners, uh, original equipment manufacturers and utilities uh, through the deployment and aggregation of these resources uh, to deliver grid services to utilities under what's called a virtual power plant, which has been mentioned uh, several times. Um, and the, the opportunity here is that people are deploying these systems. We've heard about from EV uh, uh, a charger companies, as well has a, uh, a recent partnership with, a, uh, um, with an EV charger company, NuV. Um, we, we heard about PV and uh, battery storage um, for homeowners. We heard about portable energy storage in the, in, in the prior panel. So there are a ton of different uh, resources that are out there that people are putting into their homes. And the idea for virtual power plants is to, is to, is to leverage all of these various resources by creating a, a software platform as well as a, a sort of a customer engagement um, uh, strategy for how we access those customers' devices, how we incentivize them to enroll and participate in a virtual power plant uh, in order to leverage those resources to do things like uh, decarbonize uh, the power, power generation system um, to, to balance load usage for utilities, to reduce the cost of supplying that power, uh, both to homeowners and utilities, um, and, and, and leverage these sort of local resources that are available, uh, with, you know, from folks that are spending these, this money um, on their own to deploy these systems. And, and, and distributed energy resources, you know, is, is kind of a catch-all phrase. It could also mean load control devices. Uh, Swell as a company has um, over 100 megawatts uh, of grid services contracts across six different utilities in the US, it's including Hawaii, California, and New York, um, and uh, expects to have uh, about 300 megawatt hours of, of energy storage deployed to over 15,000 uh, homes and businesses over the next uh, few years. Uh, some of those virtual power plants are, are some of the biggest in, in the country. Uh, our uh, Home Battery Rewards virtual power plant in Hawaii, it straddles Maui, the island of Hawaii, um, and Oahu, and is actually delivering from, uh, from behind the meter at residential homes, is delivering not only capacity reduction during the, during the late day peaks, but uh, is being used to, to, to build capacity during the middle of the day when solar is, is generating an excess uh, of, of grid need and provide uh, fast frequency response all from the same device. This is the, the, the quintessential example of a stacked benefit uh, scenario, which is uh, really only accessible through these types of virtual power plant utility grid services contracts uh, that, that Swell has been promoting and developing since as early as 2014. Um, One minute. And the, the idea, again, for virtual power plants, Swell brings together, we're a technology agnostic company. We bring together kind of three fun, fundamental aspects of virtual power plants. We have a development side of the business. We're one of the largest deployment uh, companies for solar and battery storage in California. Um, we partner with other technology providers, uh, load control devices, EV manufacturers, battery storage um, to deploy these projects out to customers, to work with customers directly. We have a grid services side of our business, which uh, I lead our market development team, which deals directly with utilities and negotiating contracts, performance-based contracts, uh, and developing these virtual power plant programs, these VPPs in a box. And then we have a third side of our business, which is financing. And having financing there um, allows us to offer financing solutions to customers for all of these kind of products and merge that with the grid services so that really the grid services and revenues that are associated with those programs is used to buy down the cost of these systems for consumers. We can get on the front end of that and provide an additional 10 to 15% of value to, to homeowners through the revenues that come from utilities to, to adopt these technologies. Well, excellent. Now, um, have you made deployments of your um, software in California? 
Uh, we have. We are. We actually have um, several virtual power plants, both with CCAs, community choice aggregators, and investor-owned utilities. Um, that we are, uh, and our software is called GridAmp, and it is a Derms platform that we're using. It has all of the fancy stuff that was described by Andrew and Smart Grid, um, able to do, uh, you know, algorithmic optimization of these systems, forecasting, and because it, what's what's critical for virtual power plants is is really balancing both the customer retail use case, which I show here, is a backup power, solar self consumption. TOU bill savings with the utility use case, which is the delivery of these aggregated grid services. And that there is really a balance point there because sometimes if a utility wants to use a good resource, it may actually harm the customer's retail case, which requires, which makes that more costly for the utility, right? Um, and, and potentially impactful to the customer's business model who is fundamentally paying for these systems. So what would be an ideal um opportunity for you to engage with SMUD and, and contribute to their zero carbon goal. Uh, do you need help identifying a community um, with its assets that you could put together with your, your software? Do you, have you already looked at uh, Sacramento? Um, just trying to get sort of what would be a great next step for you to be engaged in Sacramento? Well, I think um, Swell has been very successful. A, a lot of the virtual power plants that, that we're under contract to provide with utilities have been have been won through competitive solicitations uh, for those grid services. And um, SMUD recently released uh, an RFI for a virtual power plant, um, energy storage virtual power plant. I think what's important in these structures is that Swell very much so is, is both uh, an aggregator and a program implementer for these solutions, um, and historic, you know, there there is another path that some utilities are taking where um, they're looking to directly connect with these devices and control these devices on their own. I think there's there's there is at this point in the market an inherent need as an aggregator because a lot of installers don't don't necessarily understand the virtual power plant solution, nor is it in their business um, to to. to to worry about you know managing a virtual power plant or communicating that to customers and, and the same thing holds uh often for utilities that there are some concerns and risks with um controlling a customer's device on their property there's potential liability risks there's there's security uh needs and and so the the language of that that connection between utilities and and customers and customer devices i think very squarely should sit with with the aggregator model so that an entity such as swell um, can can take on both the risk of delivering on a performance contract and a program but also be able to to clearly understand and manage the business of engaging with customers and enrolling them for those virtual power plant programs great so i i, I don't know what the plans are for smud on on other RFPs, RFIs, but I'm sure that this is one that they're thinking about and uh, would encourage you to, to stay connected in the area and, and, and aware of what's going on. We have had a couple questions come into the chat that I'll, I'll turn to now. Um, Doug, on the wall box units, the, the Quasar that you've been talking about, have a question whether it's been certified to UL 1741 SA. <laughs> Yes, the, the plans to certify to UL 1741 SA for for our launch later this year. That's right. Yeah, uh, we do know, we do want to pursue projects in California, and it's a requirement, so we plan to have that as well. All right, and then for Ezra, um, John Barlow had a question of, of whether your system will integrate with with virtually any kind of PV type um, uh, brand, I guess, um, in in terms of of what you looked at. And compatibility uh, for what's offered here in, in California. So Ezra, where are you on that? Yeah, so we are compatible with any PVs. The main limit is the voltage input uh, and we are working to, to increase that. So uh, the short answer is yes. The other, I mean, because we run a string system, we have, uh, we'll have to use optimizers uh, in California, at least if not the US. So, and we're working on that. Okay, very good. So. Andrew, maybe I'll put the question to you because you're looking at the integration of a lot of these systems and, and controlling them. As I'm hearing the discussion this morning, 
Um, you know, there's wall mounted storage systems. Um, there's bi-directional charging with the uh, EVs. Uh, there's other things that can be done. It just sounds like at some point, somebody's going to get very clever about integrating all of that into one cluster of devices that, that go in the home, including uh, controlling thermostats, et cetera. Looking into your crystal ball, what are you seeing in terms of where the industry may be heading? Yeah, so I think the, the industry is heading to that area where you know each house is an individual microgrid uh, based on all this wonderful technology that's coming out, but also each house is its own you know, grid asset. Uh, and you know, from where we sit is the ability to communicate to those and help the utility understand, you know, uh, have awareness of what's out there, but then also have the ability to utilize that to truly protect their grid, I think is is really where, where this industry is going. And it's something that's certainly exciting from our point of view. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And I'll put the same question to John, um, because, I mean, you're doing a lot of creative things and integrating stuff there. So it feels to me like there's still a lot of opportunity to get all these applications to harmonize and, and, and uh, utilize this equipment and it's in, in some cases reduce redundancy of, of what's being installed in the home. Is that the way you see things emerging? Absolutely. I mean, there's, uh, let's, let's be, you know, totally upfront. A lot of the demand response programs that exist today, were kind of based on energy efficiency technology. And we're seeing uh, a real push from battery storage systems uh, participating in, into those demand response programs in a way that they haven't been, uh, you know, three, three to five years previous uh, to today. And, and then, and then you add on this, the new opportunity with EVs and we have, you know, the energy efficiency program of control thermostats are kind of a tried and true that the, the sort of the combination of those resources is still, I think, in an early days where you can say, look, we're going to we're going to look at all of these different resources. But really, battery storage can can provide power, not just to the home, but to the grid. And there are a lot of regulatory uh, policy uh, transitions that are occurring right now to enable battery storage to, to fully recognize all the value that they could provide uh, to the grid and, and to utilities. And so I think the, the technologies are here. I think it's what's really happening is, is we're seeing the evolution of the, the kind of the framework of value uh, transmission to, to, to these devices, to these customers and different business models uh, kind of coming together that are, that are combining these resources to figure out what is the, really the best path to, to enable access to these resources, uh, to enable utilities to have access to these resources while, while also you know, being able to sort of simplify the complexities associated with this uh, with, with software and different technologies. And I think that's gonna continue you know, easily in the next, uh, three to five to 10 years um, as, as more of these technologies uh, come out of the, to, to the grid and evolve and, 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 and these, these sort of pricing and value uh, programs uh, become more you know, established. All right, very good. Um, Ezra, we've got a question on there on the optimizer. John Barlow just put that in. Um, so maybe you want to respond to him offline in terms of um, 60 cycle, 50 cycle. But let me turn uh, to Kevin Wolf. Um, a lot of the installations that, that you've shown and that you've talked about, they're in, in rural settings. What about urban settings for your technology? Is, is this a potential for rooftop installations? I mean, when I think of chaotic wind systems, urban systems with all the buildings in them are about as chaotic as you're going to get. Yeah, yeah the, the humans decided not to uh, settle in windy areas. So, <laughs> and the energy in the wind is the cube of the wind speed. So the difference between a four meters per second wind and an eight meters per second wind, it's almost three times the amount of energy. So the energy is just too low in almost all urban areas. You know, places maybe like Tehachapi or out in you know, the North Palm Springs area, but the vast and Lompoc, but maybe the vast majority of urban areas are not in windy, windy enough places to, to make it efficient. And our turbines, we're not competing 
for the rooftop model. We're at an industrial stage. Our biggest market, for example, are out in Cheyenne, Wyoming, where there's a Walmart distribution center with 6.7 meters per second at 15 meters above the ground. And there is, they tried to put in a one megawatt machine, but they couldn't because it wasn't, it setback easements were too tight on the property. But we could add five megawatts of our turbine to that same property or telecommunication sites on a ridgeline near Wrightwood, where the wind is eight, eight, eight and a half meters per second at 15 meters above the ground. And they rejected a, a tall turbine because the impacts on the, the Pacific Trest, Crest Trail. And the US Forest Service is encouraging us to apply because they're just not gonna be seen. So our, our products are really areas that are rural, windy, and where there's visual or setback problems for tall turbines. All right, very good. I think one of our uh, commenters in here were challenging you on people didn't settle where there's a lot of wind. They said Chicago. Yeah, uh, not windy enough. That's probably at the most five meters per second average. They just call it the Windy City, but it's really not compared to San Gregorio Pass or the right, Montezuma the, Hills. The, the triumph of um, marketing over uh, reality. Uh, very good. Um, so... Let me just ask Peter Mackin, you're on the, the, the system here and you usually are filled with good questions. Is Peter, is there anything you would like to ask the panel? You might be on mute. Uh, and Peter may be offline. Uh, okay, no, I'm here. I was just away from my okay. desk. So, um, no, I just, well, I did have one question. Um, sort of a combo, combo question. I think it was in the chat there um, for these, um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, basically vehicle to grid, vehicle to home type uh, use. Um, has anybody been looking at, uh, um, I mean, if the if the vehicle manufacturer already says they can do it, you know, like Ford and Chevy, um, it's not a problem, but like legacy manufacturers, well, I guess I shouldn't say legacy, but like Tesla, for example, um, I haven't heard that you can do anything vehicle to grid with Tesla. Um, has anybody been looking at that? So that's probably to, uh, that's to Doug. Yes, Doug. Sure, sure, I'd answer that question. Um, definitely, so uh, the vehicles that plan to bi-directional bi-directionally charge have to be enabled to bi-directionally charge based on their battery management system. So the, the battery management system dictates how deep you can discharge, how fast you can discharge, at what temperatures you can discharge. So there's actually a lot of controls and communication between the charger and the car to make sure that none of those environmental conditions are adverse uh, to help ease any kind of degradation. Um, in the end, your battery lifespan is a matter of the number of cycles. And so there are indeed increased cycles when you're using bidirectional charging, but they're not as deep or as frequent as, for example, uh, a road trip or, or driving or daily driving where from a stoplight, you know, uh, stop and go traffic, you're actually charging or discharging and charging your car based on uh, acceleration and regenerative braking. So this is something that batteries are quite used to. Uh, when it comes to compatibility, uh, this is a standards question. So the standards are in development now for cars that use CCS standard, like Ford F-150 and, and the, uh, the Chevy Silverado. And so they're taking advantage of this to be able to offer it. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like backwards compatibility will be possible. Um, but looking forward, uh, almost all of the new models um, either have kind of battery management systems prepared for this eventuality um, or have outright announced it like, you know, Hyundai group with their vehicle to load, uh, Ford, uh, General Motors and, and Volkswagen group as well, saying that over the air updates will enable their, um, their, their vehicles to, uh, to have this capability. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I guess one thought, uh, additional thought is, you know, I mean, if you, you know, usually a home charger doesn't have this capability, but if you have the ability to actually directly access the DC battery pack, um, you know, then you don't have to worry about the, uh, uh, it's, it, in, in that case, like for a Tesla, it would just be um, software. You know, if they, if they would update their software, um, then you could, you could do it. But um, that's probably um, <laughs> not something you're looking at. <laughs> but anyway, just another thought. Yeah, we'd have to ask Elon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Send him a you tweet. Can, yeah, you can con contact him with a tweet, exactly. All right, well, I want to thank uh, our panel today for just a terrific uh, discussion as to what's going on. Kevin, Drew, John, uh, Doug, 
and Ezra. Um, so a round of applause for this panel and uh, everybody else who's been uh, participating today. I, 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 it's an amazing what you can get done in, in two hours. We were somewhat skeptical we could cram all this in, but it's just been a, a highly informative conversation. So let me turn it back over to uh, Thomas for some parting words, but but thank to everybody. Thanks to Paul Lau for participating. Obviously, we're very uh, uh, hopeful and, and impressed with what SMUD is, is doing. And uh, pleased to all the panelists. Uh, the city here is serious about becoming a leader in this area. So uh, please, if there's any way that Clean Start, Startup Stack, or SMUD can help you, uh, get your innovations uh, into the community and achieve SMUD's goal, we'd be quite interested in helping. <laughs>